Good evening. I almost hate to interrupt all, these, all this energy and excitement in the room, but um, we should get started. I'm Patricia Easton. I'm the Executive Vice uh, President and Provost here at Claremont Graduate University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. It's great to see students and staff and faculty, and we have, I think, two uh, Drucker boards here tonight. We have the Drucker School Industry Advisory Board and the Drucker School Global Family Business Institute Advisory Board. You might want to shorten that name a little bit. Um, and of course, we have two of our trustees here as well. We have uh, Trustee Ernie Maldonado and Trustee Larry Taylor. Thank you for coming. I didn't expect to give welcoming remarks tonight, but I thought, you know, I wonder what Peter Drucker said about family business. So I did a quick Google, and sure enough, there was a Wall Street Journal uh, article from August 19th, 1994. And he noted in that article that the attention goes uh, to publicly owned and professionally managed companies despite the fact that majority of, uh, of businesses are family owned, both in the US and globally. So uh, it's a, an interesting fact that so much attention uh, is drawn to those, uh, the other kinds of businesses. The major issue that Peter identified was one of succession. And you can imagine why in a family business that's particularly an acute uh, question. And he also noted that it's especially if the business is to survive beyond the third generation. There's, a, there's something at that moment in the, in the growth of a business um, where the decision is made in that fourth generation, do we stay or do we sell? And so his, uh, as always, Peter has advice, and he said, uh, if you are in a family business, always plan for succession sooner than later, and always have an outsider make the decision, especially for the top positions in, in, in the family. So that, that lends a kind of process uh, to, uh, to what can often be a fraught uh, decision. Peter also noted that unfortunately, the family managed business that survives a founder, um, let alone one that still prospers under the third generation, is still an exception. Again, he offers advice, and I'll quote from his article. Both the business and the family will survive and do well only if the family serves the business. Neither will do well if the business is run to serve the family, end quote. So I'll leave those uh, words of advice uh, from Peter with you uh, as we begin our discussion tonight. On behalf of the university, I would like to congratulate the Drucker School, the fac its faculty, its dean, its students, um, the supporters, the, the, the advisors who have helped uh, bring this to fruition, and uh, of course the opportunities and issues that affect family businesses and uh, our, um, our, our, our opportunities to address some of these global issues. The nature of family business and the issues it raises for the families who run them and the societies in which they succeed or fail are ones that of course are aligned with the CGU mission and its values. Um, our mission at CGU is to be a leader in graduate education unique in its transdisciplinary approach to societal problems. The kinds of approach uh, that, that can address the problems faced by family businesses in a global context. And our mission at CGU is to be leaders and partners in the global transformation of graduate education by connecting ideas, people, and communities for a better world. And of course, in the case of global business, family businesses, the Drucker brand provides us with tremendous opportunities to connect family businesses around the world. By encouraging them to leverage the Drucker principles, we believe the Institute will encourage the development of well-run organizations that care deeply about their responsibilities to the communities of which they are part, and therefore to make this world a better place. So, I'm very excited about this evening and what it will, will the conversations that will, will stem from it. And, uh, and I'd also, without further ado, like to welcome our Dean of the Drucker School, Dr. Jenny Derrick. Well, welcome. 
I cannot believe today has finally come. If you could see the energy and the excitement and enthusiasm around the Drucker School for tonight, the launch of the Drucker School Global Family Business Institute, you would realize that I don't think any of us believe the day would finally ever come. So it's great to be here. Great to be here. I want to quickly, uh, very quickly introduce our advisory board members. I've got Lana Abu Asi, where's Lana I saw, as our student representative. Gary Chan, who's flown in from China to represent the China contingent in global family business, uh, alum from 2004. I've got Andrew Chen, you'll meet him in just a minute. You can actually just see his office in the bottom corner. He's in Taiwan. He'll be, being, he'll be coming in soon. Uh, Koji Agura, Gurusan uh, from Japan, EMP 2011. Pat Soldano, an alum from 2000, uh, 1986, who's the principal advisor to our group. And also Alison Stewart-Allen, who is in England, but not Skyping in, the time difference doesn't help. And of course, Athena, Chira, who's currently in our program and represents the local community and family business. So welcome. So Patricia's also uh, introduced the Drucker principles and explained why there's such a close alignment with family business for us. But I want to go back to go forward, and I want to acknowledge Professors Jean Lipman Blumen and Vijay Sarthe, who many years ago started to get excited about family business and the role it could play in the school, partly because we know just how many students we have from family businesses around the world. So as met with many good ideas, we shelve it for a year and then we shelve it for a couple more years and then we dusted it off and we thought the time is now to really focus the Drucker School into areas that we think are really important for our school and our future and the communities that we serve. And tonight marks the launch of the multi-years actually in planning, although more recently the rapid six months or the rapid couple of months to bring us to today. We also uh, believe we've put on a really exciting program. I'm going to introduce different speakers as we move through the night. You can see from the program, we've got an action-packed day. We've had a great start. We, we've welcomed Jamie Richardson to our campus with Pat Soldano. We've had in incredible conversations around family business. We're just excited to get going. So the first thing I need to do now is introduce you to, to Andrew Chen, who's going to Skype him from Taiwan in just a minute. Andrew will tell his story. He, told me he's going to tell about the story when we re-met in Taiwan in 20, last, no, he's an alum from 2010, we re-met last semester, and he'll tell the story, it's a great story, I won't, I won't steal his thunder, but as I talk to Andrew, Andrew is actually a graduate of Claremont High School, he graduated uh, in the 90s, I think, and stayed in the States for quite a few years and got called back by his family business to help run the family business, and he'll talk about the family business, and you can see in the program, Program, but essentially his company makes a lot of the product that you find in Starbucks around the world. Andrew is also one of the, fo the founding donor for the Global Family Business Institute. His family has given a very generous donation that's allowed us to get started with the speed with which we're getting started and has actually helped fund tonight's event. So we're really grateful to Andrew and the generosity of his family. So without further ado, I want to introduce Andrew Chen to you and let him tell his story about how we re-met in the Comedy Bar Basement in Taiwan. Can everyone see me? Thumbs up. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, am I on? Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, I didn't know I was on. Okay. Uh, my name is Andrew Chen, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm the CEO of Woodmax. And uh, right now, uh, I'm currently reside in, in Taiwan, in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. So I, I moved back to Taiwan about five years ago. So I lived in Claremont most of my life. And uh, my, my father started this business about 35 years ago. and. Uh, uh, as a trading company of uh, 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 home supplies, appliances, and uh, also like school supplies. So, but now, uh, 35 years later, uh, Woodmax right now is a conglomerate of uh, uh, in, in design, manufacturing, and also in retail. And in, in design and manufacturing aspect, uh, Woodmax is one of the largest uh, global supplier for Starbucks. So. 
we 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 design and also we manage uh, we uh, uh, we manufacture uh, merchandise as well as the behind the counter equipment for Starbucks. And in retail side, uh, actually, and we also operate uh, a few factories throughout China and also Southeast Asia. We have. Uh, uh, one furniture company, a uh, one furniture factory in in China, and also a pen factory in China. And we'll, oh, we also have uh, up a steel factory in Vietnam. So on the retail side, um, we right now operate a an outlet mall in Angkor Cambodia, and we we're also uh, exclusive distributorship uh, of uh, Under Armour and also Nike in Cambodia. So as a as a uh, role of a CEO, uh, my my job is to ensure that each business unit uh, functions uh, uh, properly and also profitable and sustainable. Uh, and lastly, uh, Wimex also continue to work with uh, NGOs uh, in the country. We have business establishment uh, in China. We work with um, a group of volunteer teachers uh, that they, they set up schools in, in the outskirts of uh, Guizhou province so that for the kids who used to walk a few hours uh, just to go to school and now they don't have to, they can just attend schools in their local villages. And in Cambodia, uh, we work with uh, Children's, Hospi Children's Hospital and we also work with uh, the local uh, uh, village uh, head uh, just to provide daily necessities and also financial support for 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 the children uh, uh, for the hospital that that operates free work. And in Taiwan, uh, we set up scholarships and oh, we set up tuition tuition uh, funding for uh, less privileged uh, children and also. Uh, low-income uh, family children that work really hard uh, just to try to try to achieve in schools. So uh, all in all, Wimax as a company, we believe that the business is too 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 bad, but we also believe that um, conducting business ethically uh, is our principle to sustain uh, in the future. So that that's uh, so basically that's my my about me myself and also my own business. Thank you, Andrew. I thought you were going to tell the story about how we met in a bar in Taiwan. Oh, 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 okay. oh yes. On that on that note, yes, I I also I, I I'll talk about that as well. Sorry. Uh, so. Uh, the first time I, I heard about the Global Family Institute uh, was last year when uh, when Dean uh, when Dean came to Taiwan uh, to to meet the honorary um, uh, president of Asia Computer and also met with uh, the Drucker alums. And at the time, uh, we we had a small dinner gathering in Taipei, and and I shared my experience uh, with. Uh, Think Derek about the, for the last five years how I work with my uh, my family business and how I also overcome a lot of challenges because I lived in Claremont most of my life and uh, coming back to to Asia and specifically just to uh, helping my father to continue his business that definitely has obstacles and challenges uh, and then so at, at that at, on that dinner table, uh, I think Derek also shared with me about the, the global uh, family business uh, institute that Drucker is is going to launch, and and that was just just it just clicked to me that I had to I had to jump on the bandwagon and just help out school, uh, share my experience with students, how uh, how I how I went through and and, and also continue to work with uh, my father and also uh, in, in terms of uh, corporate governance and also in terms of entrepreneurship because uh, in in the market, ever-changing market, I think it's important just to stay on top of uh, not just innovation but also uh, in on, on top of uh, the, the current trend 
the market because uh, what I do here uh, is basically uh, all the uh, lifestyle items. So so we really try to stay on top of all the um, in terms of designs and also functionalities. So so uh, I think I think having uh, having this new new program, uh, the Drucker School Global Family Institute, it gives a great advantage point for school to uh, to establish networks in in Taiwan and also in uh, many uh, thriving countries in Southeast Asia because uh, currently uh, I think a lot of uh, Southeast Asian countries are growing that's why uh, I moved my family back to Taiwan and also going into Cambodia going into Vietnam um, and and these countries uh, some are just beginning to 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 grow itself uh, but in Japan in Korea in in uh, in Taiwan, uh, we went through that that big e economy boom back in the 70s and 80s when when uh, my father was about my age, uh, you know, just being un being entrepreneur. And 35 years later, uh, now he's you know seeking for a successor. And I believe that it you know all many of the corporations and small mid mid to small size corporations are also sharing that challenge of how to how to uh, how to um, find a appropriate or uh, a suitable successors to uh, to make the, the, the company sustain. So um, so in that term, I, I feel very blessed to have um, so many talented uh, team I can work with, and I'm thankful I, I can be a part of this uh, this new. Uh, program and and also attend this launch event. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So I also want to so so you can see why we're connected with Andrew. What an amazing contribution he's making by representing Taiwan. So one of the things I'll talk about toward the end of the program is our global reach and some of the program when we're going to introduce. But Andrew represents Taiwan, and we're actually meeting in a bar next week again in Taiwan, aren't we, Andrew? So we have a we have an event in Taiwan hosted by Stan Shi, the founder of Acer Computers. We're going to talk about drug innovation in Asia, and of course, family business is a part of that and uh, Andrew's on a very tight schedule he's flying in from China where he's working with the Starbucks uh, buyers to come in especially for our event and we're hosting alumni and we're hosting prospective students so for, to me Andrew represents the face of our global family institute he's global he's younger he's uh, involved in in figuring out how to enter into the family business and have his own footprint or handprint on the business through his own corporate venturing work and also pay service to the family business that he's created. I'd now like to introduce and welcome Jamie Richardson to the stage. I had the privilege and pleasure of meeting Jamie this morning, well, last night, actually. Jamie is with White Castle. He's of the family. He'll talk a lot about White Castle and its business. But as I got to meet Jamie, I realised that Jamie really exemplifies Drucker principles. It became very, very apparent to me in your, in your opening address today. What I love about Jamie's story is with White Castle, it is now fifth generation. There are 62 family members, J Jamie's fourth generation. And it very much is a great example of balancing continuity and change and taking a long view in the decisions that you make. And I know you'll talk about that soon. You're a sustainable organization that has survived through some interesting periods of history, uh, both family structure and, and issues, and also the economy as well. And you see your employees as family members and, and one big extended family. What I also enjoy, and you can see this on the bio of, An of Jamie, he's deeply involved in his community, and that's something else that draws us to family business and people like Jamie. He serves in many capacities with the Red Cross, with the YMCA and the Catholic Foundation. So please, Jamie, thank oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I mean, to get to this day and this moment in time doesn't happen overnight. And it takes vision, it takes persistence and courage. And uh, this might be the ribbon cutting, which is pretty celebratory, but there was a lot of effort and energy that took to get here. So congratulations to everybody. Man, you bet. I thought I'd share some of our, our White Castle story um, as a family-owned business. And I think one of the things I hope you find might be fun about it is it's really about our story as an operating business in one sense, but also through the lens of, hmm, 
would that brand be quite the same if it wasn't a family-owned business? And I think that could be kind of an interesting perspective. And you know, the other thing I was thinking about, I had the chance to uh, visit and walk around campus today. It's my first time to visit here. And, and my goodness, I know what they say about trees and page PhDs and all that, but it's an amazing, amazing place and a very contemplative place. Uh, and I, I thought, usually I don't mix hamburgers and philosophy, but if ever, <laughs> if ever I had permission to do it, I think it might be here. So, so if you bear with me, I think a quote that comes to mind is from uh, the philosopher George Wilhelm Hegel, who said, this we can assert absolutely. Nothing great in this world was ever accomplished without passion. And I think it's that passion that brings you to this point in time. It's that passion that we uh, really lean on to, as a family business, to get to the next day, each and every day. And I thought about that a little bit and thought, what do we have in common? You know, and, and there's a lot that we have in common. And I think the principles of the Drucker School are right in lockstep with family business values. And this is how we would express it. There, there might be different words that say similar, uh, express similar ideas, but for us that means you take a longer view. That it's not the sudden tug in an emergency when something doesn't go exactly as planned, but it's that ability to have the discipline and courage to ride it out, to see what comes next. And it's also a belief that, that people matter that it isn't about cosmic billiard balls being plugged in different places, that there's a unique dignity that each person brings to what they do, and that we might have different roles and different titles and different callings in the business or wherever, but that the one thing we absolutely believe at White Castle is we are all equal in dignity. And, and that's the foundation for so many of our decisions to really understand what should we do when we come to a fork in the road? What should we do when we come to a moment where we really have to think through what's next? And, and that, to us, that people matter is really something we, we really uh, count on. And that values do count. That they're not just words you come up with once in a while and put in the manila folder and, and find later and, and rewrite, but that you really try to bring them to life and find examples of those values you can share with others so that we can all become better. Um, that, that it's really a mutually beneficial kind of situation. Uh, and then the, the final thing I'd say that's family business we share with everything you're doing is that desire to make a difference. That we hope to make the world a better place. Uh, in your mission, you mentioned connecting ideas, people, and community. And I think there's something really powerful about that. So that's kind of the, the framework. I'm going to share just a little bit about where it all started. I mean, we need a little bit of history because, my goodness, the closest of White Castle is in Las Vegas. There's not one next door, so I figure I should at least share just some quick background. In the beginning, it was 1921, and our founder, Billy Ingram, uh, was a realtor and an insurance broker who made a friend in the Rotary Club named Walt Anderson. And Walt had a hamburger stand. And Billy thought that Walt might be onto something. Uh, and so he came to him one day and said, what if we went into business together? Because they were great friends. Uh, and Billy had some ideas about how the business could be even stronger. And now at the time, uh, this is not too long after Upton Sinclair's The Jungle had come out. It was not a very flattering look at the meatpacking industry in Chicago. And in fact, uh, you know, good moms everywhere would not feed their kids hamburger. That was something for the carnival, not something you do at home. So Billy knew right from the get-go, the focus would have to be on cleanliness. And so, uh, and he also wanted people to know they weren't a fly-by-night operation. They were going to be around for a while, hopefully. Whew, thank goodness. <laughs> but, uh, so he came up with the name White Castle. White for cleanliness and castle for permanence and strength. And uh, they opened the first one in Wichita, Kansas. Hamburgers were five cents. Uh, we didn't change the price till 1946. We, we cranked it up to a dime then, so <laughs> we probably saw some drop off in demand maybe. But, uh, uh, but it, and really we've been going and growing ever since. So, and today we have 385 restaurants. We're in 13 states. And we also have a retail foods division that sells to the grocery store. So you can get some after the show tonight. Um, but, and, and I really think that's been characterized by this constant striving uh, from a single store to really focusing on the principles that got us there. But, and I'd like to just for a minute start with something that I think you might get a kick out of. We had a White Castle pledge, and everybody in the world of White Castle knew this pledge. It was like serving, well, I'm not even going to say it. We've got a better representative who can share it. This is our second generation leader, Edgar Ingram. The skills of each person in every part of the organization are vital to the fulfillment of our pledge to our customers, serving the finest products for the least cost in the cleanest surroundings with the most courteous personnel. That was our reason to exist. Uh, and to a person, 
Even as recently as five years ago, you could go to any White Castle and ask a team member, what's the White Castle pledge? And that individual would rattle it off. And, and it was really amazing. Now, you notice I'm using the past tense because we did something pretty drastic and pretty dramatic. We retired the pledge because we realized that as good as the pledge was, it served us well for so many decades that the world was changing around us and that our customers today want more variety, that they want more of an experience. And while we had really fundamental things that were part of that that were important, we needed to reach a little bit higher. And so we actually went around to each city and we had a pledge retirement ceremony. It was like a funeral. <laughs> Earlier today, I almost started crying. <laughs> I just remembered it. And, but we had every person sign their name to the pledge on a big banner, and then we framed those banners and put them in all of our offices and in the castles. We had pictures of it. And then we unveiled and introduced where we're headed next. And it's our vision and our mission. And this is our heart for hospitality. Uh, that, that vision is to feed the souls of Craver generations everywhere. And then our mission is to create memorable moments every day. And now to a person, anybody, all 10,500 team members of White Castle, when asked that question, are able to let you know that our mission is to create memorable moments every day. And that's what we strive to do. Sometimes, maybe you've driven from Claremont to Vegas for a late night run. We better make sure we're doing a good job and giving you a hot and tasty slider to enjoy on your way home. So I share that just as background. And, and what I'd like to do next is transition a little bit, share the story of the brand in a fairly condensed fashion. I mean, heck, it's 97 years. We'll get in at least. 12 minutes, we should be able to get through that. And then I'll close out by sharing uh, how being a family-owned business has been a challenge that's so worth it. We believe that family businesses are worth fighting for. We're so thankful for what you're doing because the need is great, but with great people here, it's gonna make a difference in this part of the world, and I predict that global's there for a reason, and you're gonna see a global impact, and you already are. So that's pretty cool. But for us, the first passion I'd like to talk about is our passion for people. And so Billy knew from the beginning, if you're going to be in the service business, uh, you really need to treat your people right, because if they're not happy, they're not going to give great service. And in fact, he has some great writings, and it's all the elegant language of the early 1920s. We have found that roughshod assistance seems the rule, and people are treated poorly. And, and, but his point was that happy employees make happy customers. Another expression of his was, we have no right to expect loyalty except from those to whom we are loyal. So we wanted to put our money where our mouth was. So in 1925, we launched a health insurance program, unheard of in the time. I'm sure his experience in the insurance business probably shaped that. We uh, introduced really generous retirement benefits in, in late 1920s. And we initiated something that was then called the service credit bonus. Today it's the holiday bonus. And based on how long you've been at White Castle, every year in early December, a percent of sales is put into a pool and then divided by, between all White Castle team members based on how long they've been in the business. And so everyone really looks forward to it. And for some, it's the difference between maybe having a real generous Christmas or not much Christmas at all. So it's something that we really, uh, had, over the years, that passion for people has come through. Today, of our 10,500 team members, more than one in four have been at White Castle 10 years or more. And of our top 450 people in restaurant operations, 442 started behind the counter in an hourly job and were promoted through the ranks. So we're just really fortunate to have incredible people who make, make creating memorable moments possible. We have a passion for sharing our story. And you know, as a family-owned business, many of you can probably relate to this. Over the generations, we were pretty shy. We were intrinsically shy. We didn't like talking about ourselves very much. And I think we started to realize that for our team members and others, it was okay to be involved and engage and share a little bit more of ourselves. So one day, I'll never forget because it just so happened, the call came in to me, the phone rang, and the person said that she was from Hollywood and that she was working for entertainment clearances. There was a film of two likable underdogs who spend an evening of misadventure and then go to White Castle. And I'm not kidding, I looked at my calendar to see if this was April Fool's Day. I thought it was Deanna Winder, my high school friend, making a joke on me. And uh, so I said, okay, send the script along. And then I got the script, and my goodness, they failed to mention it was rated R. And uh, <laughs> that was a surprise. So I uh, so thought, well, we better have some discussions about this. And the discussions turned into some pretty good debate until finally there was kind of a, a pronouncement. It's like, well, if you want to talk to Bill Ingram about it, that's fine. And Bill is our third-generation CEO. And 
thought, oh my goodness, I don't know if I should do that. Well, what the heck? So I'll never forget, I was waiting outside of his office and I had my speech all rehearsed and I was gonna tell him about the opportunity and why I thought it would be a good thing for us to be involved in. And I went in and I saw him sitting behind his desk and I completely panicked <laughs> and I froze and I said, it's rated R for raunchy, it has sex, drugs, and rock and roll, <laughs> and other than that, it's really good for us. <laughs> and Bill got really quiet, I thought, uh-oh, and I almost started to kind of walk out of his office. And then he, he looked at me and he asked the greatest question ever. He said, does it make fun of our team members? I said, no, no, it's pretty complimentary of our team members. He says, oh, I'm fine with it. And so uh, that is the background story on how the greatest film ever in the history of humankind, <laughs> Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle, uh, uh, got green-lighted. Uh, it didn't win the Academy Award, but maybe next time around. So. But, uh, and along the way, we've been part of shows like Undercover Boss and done other things. And it's helped us feel more comfortable, I think. And team members have really enjoyed being part of that. I'd say we also have a passion for celebrating the good. And the person you see on the screen is the most famous person in the history of White Castle. I'm not referencing Edgar Ingram, our second generation leader, or Bill Ingram, our third generation leader, but Elaine Masita. And this is Elaine getting her 25 year watch. Uh, this is Elaine getting her 50 year pin. And then in the lower right, that's Elaine getting her 67 year pin right before she retired. And uh, that was such a momentous event that we looked in the Guinness Book of World Records to see certainly that's the longest time of employment ever. It turns out there was a gentleman in India who had 70 years of service at his company. So I'll never forget going to Elaine and mentioning that to her, asking her, I was starting to ask her if she'd like to go for the record. She started shaking her head and she said, not a chance, honey. <laughs> <laughs> but the neat thing about Elaine's retirement, when that occurred, Bill Ingram did something he'd never done in the history of White Castle. He let her keep her security badge. We figured she was a safe risk, so she can come and go as she pleases. <laughs> And then the other thing the board of directors did at White Castle is they declared her hire date, June 8th, as Elaine Masita Day. And now, every year on June 8th, Elaine comes back to the office. She's 97, she'll be 97 this December. And there's a ceremony, and all the team members who have 15 years of service, not much compared to her 67 years, but those 15-year team members get a lapel pin that says, 52 years to go. And that's just kind of a fun way to recognize what she means to White Castle. We have a passion for creating memorable moments. And you know, we started to realize wherever we'd go, we'd, we'd make new friends. And often, and some of you might be uh, in, this, in this camp, you might have a White Castle story. And we love that. That's the nourishment we're looking for, is to hear those great stories of first time I had White Castle, or this, this happened to me one time. That there's so many great stories. What if we had a Cravers Hall of Fame? And we didn't know how to go about that. So we did what we usually do, try until we figure something out. But we put onto our hamburger sack, really at the last second, do you, are you a Hall of Famer? And encouraged people, and we gave them just a little bit of space to write their story, and said, send it in. And we thought, gosh, maybe we'll get a couple hundred. The first year, we received 1,867 nominations. Some were a little greasy, um, but that's OK. Um, but in those nominations, not only did we get the little paragraph, but people were sending uh, videotape of their wedding reception. We didn't even know we were in the catering business. Uh, all these different things where people had enjoyed White Castle. And uh, we brought that first group of Hall of Famers in. And Bill Ingram, third generation CEO, said, do you realize you're among a very elite group of people that more people have won Super Bowl rings, more people have won Nobel Prizes, that you've been scorned and ridiculed your entire lives for your love of our product, that in our hearts and hallways your names will always be held as sacred? And that's when Michelle Purcell, inductee from Chicago, Illinois, started to cry. And she slowly lifted her pant leg and revealed her White Castle ankle tattoo. <laughs> so, so here among friends, a shortcut to entry into the Hall of Fame is a White Castle permanent tattoo. But along the way, uh, you know, we've been able to have a lot of fun uh, doing different things with the Hall of Fame. We now have Valentine's Day celebration. So uh, on Valentine's Day, we convert from being a fast food restaurant to fine dining. And so this year, we partnered with Open Table to take reservations. 30,000 reservations for Valentine's Day. Uh, sometimes a musician will show up spontaneously, so don't be alarmed if a cello is right next to your table. That's OK. Uh, and it's just amazing to see the fun that people had in celebrating that tradition. And it's busy. We do tableside ordering, and it's just a lot of fun. And I think that spirit of family and, and having a good time is what, what propels that. Uh, and back to the Hall of Fame, this is this year's induction class. Uh, after, after dinner, they went to the castle in Indianapolis that was near us, where we were visiting for an event, and, and had a blast. 
And those stories over the years have led to us learning about more uh, even famous celebrity cravers. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, the stories are so funny that you, you laugh out loud, and other times they're very poignant. And uh, one that I'll share just real briefly is about a woman named uh, Mel. And Mel, unfortunately, um, was very seriously ill and had uh, a terminal illness. And her sister uh, would visit her and spend time with her at the hospital. And what they would do is she'd get a report, and they knew that the prognosis wasn't good, but the one thing that brought joy to them they would slip out. They would literally sneak out of the hospital. She wasn't supposed to leave. They'd dress her up, and they'd sneak out and go to White Castle. And then they'd come back and like, act like nothing happened, and get her in her room and everything. And that was such a powerful memory for them that her sister's last wish, and we took this very seriously, her sister's last wish uh, was to be cremated and put in a White Castle urn. And uh, you know, it's, it's funny, and she wanted people to laugh about it. And so uh, you know, I'll never forget getting that call and thinking that was another April Fool's Day prank. <laughs> But uh, so uh, yeah, we're not selling these tonight. <laughs> but I uh, just want uh, it just to us shows that um, the the depth of feeling and emotion and part we play in people's lives. And then there's this guy, Alice Cooper, Cravers Hall of Famer. Who knew? And uh, he showed up, and we got to interview him inside the Craver Studio and instead of inside the Actor Studio. So please don't tell James Lipton. Uh, later he would post. Uh, they put me in the Cravers Hall of Fame. They made a throne of White Castle burgers. I ate it. So. Uh, <laughs> We've had fun along the way with different people who've interacted with us in that, in that dimension. So um, there's also a passion for hot and tasty food that I think from the beginning was one of Billy's focuses and one of uh, the areas of focus for all of us. But one of the things that happened, and I shared that we'd share things that have gone really good for us and things that haven't gone so good. And so one of our team members had a great idea. We put 30 burgers on a grill at once. What if we put those burgers in a pizza box and use that as a way, because people eat sliders, kind of like they eat slices of pizza. We were so excited about it. So we went ahead and we got the packaging all done. We got all the signage made. We got seven castles that agreed to test it. And in retail and restaurants, you often know if you've got a hit or a miss within hours. So we launched the, the test. A couple hours later, the phone started ringing off the hook. There was just one small problem. The pizza box didn't fit through the drive through window. So we didn't do all of our research. <laughs> we were tempted to just walk away from it. But, but thankfully, uh, the team got together, and we came up with a better idea, the most distinguished, elegant packaging in all fast food, my friends, the Crave Case. It holds 30 sandwiches, has a faux stitch leather handle, and fits in an overhead bin if you're traveling. The next thing, of course, that came out of that was if 30 is good, 100 must be better. So the Crave Crate was next. Yeah, there's the Crave Crate. And uh, don't tell anybody, but I've already shared some secrets. We're also working on the Crave Palette. That's uh, 5,872 burgers. So, uh, but that passion for hot and tasty food really led us into another category, uh, the frozen food section. So third generation CEO Bill Ingram noticed when he was out visiting the restaurants, uh, there'd be customers taking sacks home, and he'd ask them, what are you doing with that? He said, oh, I've got something new called a microwave oven. I'm going to keep these in my freezer and have them throughout the week. So he went to, no kidding, three different manufacturers and asked, Would, we'll license it. We don't know how to do this. And two uh, different manufacturing potential partner, they laughed at him a little bit and said, sorry, thanks for thinking of us. That will never work. You're not going to be able to sell restaurant food in the grocery store. That's not how this whole operation works. Thank goodness he didn't listen. So um, we did it ourselves. And today, we have three plants dedicated to manufacturing the, the freezer product, uh, the, the retail foods. And we've got 93% distribution around the country. We just uh, got accepted in Walmart in Canada. And it's 25% of our sales and a bigger share of cash flow and profit. So it's been really, really wildly successful thanks to Bill's uh, persistence. We have a passion for and a reverence for where we've come from. We try to keep that in mind as a family business especially and making those memories be part of who we are. Um, I think more importantly, especially as we've started to transition to fourth generation, we have a real passion for what's next. And so we're doing things we wouldn't have done before. Um, I'll point to the, the lower left of the screen as you look. That's our, our new castle in Vegas. And it's right on the Las Vegas Strip. And we've actually partnered with another family business. So they're a licensee for us, which we didn't think we'd ever do. They're amazing. They do great work. And everybody wins. Uh, when we went out for the, the grand opening, we thought we would cut the ribbon and do all those kinds of things. We ended up working on the grill for four hours. And I'm slow. And at one point, I remember saying, is that really 67 double cheeseburgers with no onion? That's a big order. 
Uh, this is our, our fourth generation CEO, Lisa Ingram, at the end of that day, just trying to figure out what the heck just happened. But it's the only time we've had to have, I call it a changing of the guard ceremony. We ran out of hamburger. We had to close down and get, get new supplies and it went that fast. Um, we've just opened two castles in Shanghai and continue to explore to see uh, what, what might be possible. And we're super excited about how that's going. Um, we also have a passion for uh, fashion, believe it or not. And this is a fun one where we got a call out of nowhere. It was on our 800 line. The woman's name was Kirsty Dare. And, and in the message it said, sponsor canceled our fashion show, is White Castle into fashion? And so we called her and found out that, yes, we are into fashion. And they were looking for a place to have their after party. So we had it at White Castle. And little did we know that that would launch uh, Telfar Clemens, who last year was named Vogue Magazine and Council of Fashion Designers of America Fashion Fund Award winner. So he's off to the races now. He's in Berlin, and then he's in Paris. And it's just been amazing. He designed our uniforms for us. And this is a partnership we did on a mashup logo of his logo and ours that we sold at an event in New York in Brooklyn. And we thought we had a three-month supply. Everything sold out that, that night. All of the net proceeds, 100%, go to the uh, RFK Center for Justice and bail relief for kids who are being held on Rikers and, and uh, don't have any relief from that. So it's been a good cause, and it's been a great partnership. So along the way, it's been a lot of fun to get to know everyone. And then yesterday, we announced a partnership with Impossible Foods where we're testing 100% plant-based protein that looks and tastes and presents like beef. So, uh, and customers are excited about that. So we're covering some ground. And uh, I think for us, it's about trying to stay current and test ourselves. And we've uh, increased our tolerance for failure. We're not afraid if something doesn't work. We know we can learn from it and grow. Uh, so that's been a good thing. I also would say, like many of you, we have a passion for making a difference in our communities. We're real involved with a group called Autism Speaks. We're real involved with empowering people, including our team members with scholarship funds, and do everything we can to, to give back, often quietly, but with a focus on results, because we know that's important and that investment matters. I'll share one quick story. We also try to be creative if we can. Um, we use the lens of Castle Share, uh, Feeding Hunger, Hopes, and Dreams, because we believe all good philanthropy should really be about nourishment and how we give back. And sometimes we can do that with a smile. And so I'll share a story. We call it the little candle that could. This goes back a few years, but I was at a dinner, and someone said, do you know who's seated next to you? I said, I have no idea. That's Laura Slatkin. She's the queen of home fragrance. I didn't even know that. And so I kind of thought, you know, she apparently had a candle company, and I leaned over and introduced myself and said hello. And, you know, and then someone else said, she's a Manhattan socialite. I didn't know what that meant. But uh, <laughs> so I jokingly said something like, it'd be kind of fun if there was ever a White Castle hamburger scented candle, wouldn't it? And she was really quiet. And she went, hmm. <laughs> that was about it. And then, uh, I'm not kidding, uh, six weeks later, uh, mail delivery came at work, and there's this mason jar. I opened it up, and it smelled like a White Castle, and there's a little post-it note that said, the beef is there, the bun is perfect, I'm still working on the pickle and onion. <laughs> XO, XO, Laura. <laughs> and that led to the creation of the, the, uh, the White Castle hamburger scented candle back at the House of Crave. So, and, uh, and we donate 100% of the net proceeds from this to Autism Speaks. And so, so far, we've raised $250,000 through the sale of the candle. So it's been a lot of fun. They even made fun of us on Saturday Night Live. So I, they said, oh, now your home can smell like White Castle, like it doesn't already. You know, and they, <laughs> thanks, Seth Meyers. Uh, and yes, that is Martha Stewart. It's kind of blurred a little bit. But she was at our uh, launch party for the candle. So that was fun. But uh, I'll close out and just share uh, our family perspective. We think that family isn't limited to direct descendants of Billy Ingram. In fact, we think anyone committed to being part of the White Castle family 10,500 people strong, shares the values and, and also um, gets to be part of something hopefully a little bit bigger than ourselves. And that as the family though, and as ownership, it's really, really important we make good decisions because the decisions we make impact real people every day. Um, there are three rules I'd say we try to live by. And in this passion for family, I think I give a lot of credit to um, my wife and her cousins and her siblings' grandparents. Edgar and Clovis were the second generation leaders of the company. And they did such a great job uh, building character and common experiences that everybody who grew up in different households has respect and love for one another. And that's not to say there's not disagreement. There absolutely is. There are moments of tension, moments of debate. But one of the things that's come about over the years is a genuine respect. Uh, the three rules we try to live by, 
Um, there's no substitute for shared experience. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and to everything there's a season. The first of those, we really started to understand that if we were going to grow as a family and be a family business, we needed to spend more time together. So for the past 14 years, we've been having a family meeting every summer. And in that time, uh, boy, in the beginning, it was a little bit, you know, what are we even going to talk about? So we have a family business advisor. And he's just a wonderful person. He's really smart. He's also humble. And to be smart and humble is a great combination. And so some of the first things he had us work on as a family were creating a mission, vision, and values. And from that, uh, vision, values, and guiding principles, we really started to understand that where one branch might have thought, oh, I bet you those cousins want, they just want the money. They want to sell it. Well, what we realized is we might have different words that we express things with. We might have different areas of strength. But everyone was 100% committed to remaining a family-owned business. So one of the biggest things that came out of the statement of vision, values, and guiding principles was uh, our desire is to remain a family-owned business for generations to come. And so from that, a lot of good work started to happen, including we created a family employment policy that really defined, hey, if you want to work here, are there requirements? How should that, is there a process? Uh, to make it transparent. So it didn't feel like, oh, well, she just got that job because Uncle Larry asked or whatever it might be. And so that's been unifying over time and really, really helpful to us. And then this notion of the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Boy, we were so afraid to talk about the tough stuff. And you know, nothing horrible necessarily had ever happened. But getting to that point of being able to communicate openly has been so gratifying and so good for us because we can have good, reasonable conflict and debate. And we're a conflict-averse family, so that wasn't easy. But getting to know that and understanding that we could take seven years to do this, or we could be thoughtful and purposeful and make sure everyone feels comfortable and get there a lot quicker. I would still say we're not super speedy. We're, we're pretty quick on things regarding the brand and the business, because in our world, we have to be. And when it comes to the family, we want to be purposeful, transparent, inclusive, thoughtful, to make sure that we're all going in the same direction together. And if not, we'll press pause and spend more time thinking and talking about it to get to that place in a way that feels like we're really there. Doesn't mean that one person can veto a great idea, but it does mean we're going to take the time to hear all points of view and, and be inclusive along the way. And by the way, this is a fun gathering of our fifth generation. A few years back, we took them to a local family-owned ice cream company. Now, it's not the Creamery in the Twin Cities, but uh, it is Velvet Ice Cream in Utica, uh, Ohio. But um, we find those experiences are really powerful for the kids, too, to meet other families, other family businesses. Um, and then I'll just close out with a, a, a few final thoughts. To everything, there's a season. So I think what we've realized is transition is so important. And the Drucker commentary on it's never too early to start. Um, we're so thankful the third generation really purposely crafted and put something together that gave us the chance to shape a process. And from that process, there was an opportunity for any family member to say if they were interested in the top spot. And then for those three who were, they worked as a committee collaboratively, not competitively, to map out what the future for White Castle should look like. The big move we made also during this time, we went from a board that was all top management and non-family, a couple family members, um, but mostly non-family, to gradually moving towards an independent board of directors, each with their own expertise and knowledge that they bring to the table so he or she can have attitudes that really help us do better. So today we have a board of eight, three family members, and five independent directors, which has been profound in terms of the difference it's made. So but that process actually was very unifying. That group then, those three individuals who are most interested in being in the top spot, worked together to make the recommendation about what the organization of the future should be. And after a couple of years of, of making some changes and thinking about it, they all unanimously agreed that Lisa Ingram, a uh, fourth generation family member and the cousin of the other two, should be our CEO. And that she had the best skill set to lead us where we needed to be. And that they had complementary skills that could make us all stronger. So all that through the family made everyone, and we communicated along the way too. So it made us all a stronger family. And then, you know, hey, don't forget to say goodbye. Bill Ingram gave his life to this business. He's still the chair of our board. We surprised him, and he's a little bit shy. So we did a This Is Your Life Bill Ingram with 500 people in the room. And we had everybody from grade school teachers to friends from college. He was really nervous about them uh, coming out from behind the screen. And we had just a fun evening. So I think that notion of celebrating and, and allowing that to be part of your your uh, expression is really important too. So I guess I'll close it out with a quick Beatles lyric, because and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. And then uh, this is, if you see me on the streets of Ohio, you'll know me for my vehicle, hopefully. 
because uh, this is my personal ride. Uh, <laughs> and we'll see you at the drive through my friends. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite the panelists to the front. Uh, Jamie you might just want to take a seat, sure. and, and I'll invite you to the front to introduce. What a wonderful story! And we're so grateful to Jamie to come in from Ohio. He's got five children, aged between nine and eighteen, all still at home. One's about to go off to college, and to give up so much time to us, we're really grateful. Thank you. While we're bringing yeah. our panelists down to the front, I also want to acknowledge we are on Facebook Live. I have no idea how many people are watching, but we are beaming this around the world. A, a lot of people were interested in coming but just couldn't give the time to come down to Claremont. So welcome to whoever in the world is viewing us live right now and thank you for joining. So I'd like to introduce two more people to you. You now know Jamie. I'll, I'll start with uh, Randall Lewis who's become, uh, Randall's well known to people in Claremont. Randall is, is uh, not only a graduate from Claremont McKenna College but also very well known for the work he's done in property development and the work he does in the local arts scene and also how much work he can continues to do to contribute to urban planning and urban policy. And I had the privilege of having brunch or breakfast with Randall a little while ago, and we talked to Randall about our vision for the Family Business Institute, and Randall asked some quite tough questions, don't you, Randall? And so I, I, got, I got a little bit of what I call the Spanish Inquisition, if you watch Monty Python, <laughs> but it was a good Inquisition, and, and some great questions were asked, and we're delighted to have Randall partner with us on our very important launch tonight. The other person I'd like to introduce is Pat. Now, we didn't meet in a bar in Taiwan, but we met at the cafe on the 71 freeway that's halfway between Anaheim Hills and Claremont. So we, we looked at a map, we kind of figured out where halfway was, and that's where we meet. So we have this little cafe. I don't know what it's called. Do you remember? Rendezvous it? Cafe. Rendezvous Cafe. There you go. All right, so we meet yes. at this cafe. <laughs> and, and it's through Pat's leadership and her guidance and encouragement where we got talking about family business, and I introduced the ideas that we had as a faculty and our ideas idea that we had so many people who were from family business and we thought we wanted to pay attention to it. And Pat's eyes just lit up and I remember that first breakfast and, and you, you pushed me along a little bit for the first couple of months and then we got <laughs> moving. But Pat, as you can see from the bio, is very deeply involved in family business and, and has advised and worked with family offices and family businesses for over 30 years, is in a position now where she's on Capitol Hill lobbying more recently for ta on the tax reform policy but has an incredibly important role and voice, and from all accounts, according to Jamie, is the person you want on Capitol Hill <laughs> petitioning on behalf of family businesses. We also uh, are really incredibly grateful to Pat for being our principal advisor for, on the Family Business Council as we've launched the Family Business Institute. We've tra taken great guidance from you, so thank you so much for what you've done to get us to tonight, Pat, and I look forward to the panel you're about to chair, so thank you. Well, thank you, Jenny. We really, really appreciate your vision and guidance, and you've been fantastic to work with. So, um, so the way we wanted to run this panel is to, we, we had three panel members. Unfortunately, one wasn't able to be here. So um, it's going to be a little bit more intimate, I think, in terms of, of the response to the questions. Um, and so what I, I thought we would do is, is talk for just a few minutes on each of you, your backgrounds, and the family. Now, Jamie, you know, we, we know a lot about White Castle and the business and a little bit about the family because you just shared that. But maybe it would be helpful to talk a little bit more about you and your role with the family mm -hmm. and how the family interacts. And you talked a little bit about it, but more so how yeah. the family interacts with the business. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, as a fourth generation business now, I think uh, what's really been fascinating and fun for me is that um, uh, I'm an in-law who has the opportunity to work in the business, and so uh, I've been given a role. About 10 years ago, the family asked if I would be more involved in shareholder relations and uh, government relations, public relations, and philanthropy. And so what's been amazing about that is um, our team gets to be ambassadors of goodwill, hopefully, for White Castle, and also, I think, proactively can work on a lot of the family governance. Uh, uh, so for instance, um, we've led the efforts on selecting the independent directors. And, and actually have really focused a lot of our efforts on communicating to the family. One of the biggest challenges we've had uh, was getting people information the same way at the same time. 
So uh, through no one's fault, I think there were some bad feelings at different points when, well, how come this person knows or is aware and I've never been told? So we've really, um, we do a quarterly call, for instance, where uh, all the family members are invited to call in. If they can't, we record it and then we send out a link so they can listen to it afterwards. So, um, so I think our role is to really uh, hopefully put our best foot forward, be investors of goodwill for White Castle and at the same time, look out for the long-term success of the, of the family. Well, and Randall, as, as Jenny said, you know, most people know Lewis Companies and they certainly know you, but I think that there's, it would be helpful for you to share a little bit more about the family and how the family interacts with the business. Oh, sure. Well, first, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Jamie. What a fantastic presentation. Thank you. I, I was struck how similar our family is to your family. We're in and out people instead of White Castle. <laughs> White Castle. <laughs> we like them. <laughs> Other than that, tremendous similarities. We're in the third generation, I'm second generation. Should I talk at all about the company or not? Oh, yeah, yeah sure. I mean, just yeah. very briefly, my parents were home builders who grew a very good sized home building business. They had four sons. My parents have passed away now, but over the years, we built almost 60,000 houses. We now don't build homes anymore, but we do what are called master plan communities where we get pieces of property where we can build anywhere from 1,000 to 8,000 houses. We do shopping centers, we do apartments, and we do big industrial projects. We're throughout California and Nevada. So we're a pretty full service real estate company. We have about 650 employees right now. And then we've got my brothers still work, but we're going, I'm the youngest of the four brothers. And so we're going through a transition. Even today, one of our key people said, you know, when you guys look in the mirror, you see a lot of gray hair. What are you doing about transition? And, and so it's something we, we're dealing with now. We have seven in the next generation, and we're going to be dealing with those transition issues. I have three kids, two of them live in New York, and all three live in New York. Two of them have announced they're coming back. One is going to come work for the business in August, and the second will probably come before the end of the year. So we'll be dealing with issues of generation two, a couple of them slowly getting out at exactly the same time that generation three, two of them will be coming in. So I, I think we're structured where we try to be a family that serves the business mm -hmm. and, and, so, and, and not vice versa. We, we try to be very intentional. We try to be very long-term in our thinking. And right now, I think some of the challenges we are dealing with are these transition issues and issues that Jamie's family, luckily, has had a couple generations ahead of us. But how do you decide which, when you've got family members who may be owners but not active participants, what are the right rules? When you've got family members that say, I'd like to be involved in the philanthropy, but what are the qualifications to be a donor? Everyone likes to give away money, but it's actually as hard, it may be harder to give away money strategically than to make money. But it's fun to give it away, but it's hard to do it well. So we're dealing with a lot of those issues. A commercial for Pat, we, we worked very closely with Pat and with Sandy back there. Now we're working with a firm called Gin Spring, and they've been a real help for us. I think we're five years into the process of having formal quarterly family meetings trying to come up with plans to, to create places to talk to get together, to have shared memories. That's very helpful. So, so on that point, um, family businesses typically don't survive the third generation. You've all heard the 70% of most family businesses do not survive the third generation. Uh, and most people believe that's because of communication issues. So and maybe you could talk a little bit about, is the business of the family a legacy? Do you see it as a legacy for the family? And if so, do you see that it, how, how do you promote it as a legacy as opposed to an entitlement? And how, how do the children, how do the next generation see it? Do they see it as a legacy and, and, and responsibility toward that legacy or do they see it more as an entitlement? And, and how do you make sure that it's going in the right direction? Uh, I think that's a great question. And I think fortunately that fourth generation of family members didn't see it as an entitlement. Um, you know, definitely there were differences in household in terms of who felt plugged in or not. Um, but I think the learning has been overall, and we're, we're learning as we go, with a fifth generation, trying to give them shared experiences and trying to educate them around the idea, this isn't about necessarily you get a job for life. This isn't about working in the business. Because we think that could create an artificial pressure or expectation that 
the parents are going to be disappointed if you don't have a passion and want to, want to work in the restaurant business. What if you want to do something completely different? So our focus has really shifted from worrying too much about who's going to work in the business and who won't uh, to how do we make sure that when this is the group that sits around the table, they've got a really good experience of what it means to be a family-owned business. Because if they're just looking at the dollars, it's going to be really easy for them. They'll just say, we'll sell it um, because it's worth more dollar-wise. But... Uh, you know, than the cash or anything they'll gain benefit-wise. So um, we do that lots of different ways. A lot of that is just, um, for instance, last year at our family meeting, each of the kids uh, had the opportunity, they had like an hour to create an art project. You know, and they had this great big room and people giving them guidance. And the older kids did this too. And then they put everything out and we had a silent auction. And so, uh, thank goodness Aunt Nancy was there. She really opened up the checkbook. <laughs> and so she put us over 700 bucks total, I think, with her last purchase. But then the next day, the same kids who had made the art um, had $700, I think 761 bucks. They had to figure out what charity to give it to. And they had to come up with a process and think through it. And then they reported back to us at that dinner that night. And they chose three different charities. So, you know, they had some guidelines. But it was fun to see them work through that and, and see it was a good experience. So. Randall, do you have an answer to that? Sure. Well, I think for our family, we, we've had these meetings for five years, and we've pretty much concluded at least the generation two, which I'm in, we want an evergreen business. Mm -hmm. Generation three have all said, we want an evergreen business, but they're 26 to 45. So really the test will be what happens when we're gone in their 10 or 20 years from now, which is what Jamie said and said, gosh, we should consider selling. I, I see our company going through a bit of a transition Right now, our main business is just doing real estate development, which in California is an awful business. It takes forever. You get sued. It's a, it's a terrible business. We <laughs> gradually, and we're going to keep doing that for five years and 10 years, and we'll probably do it for 20 years. But we consciously are saying, how can we become more of a, a long-term investor building apartments? We own about 10,000 apartments. We don't forget to maybe 14 or 15,000. We own about 25 shopping centers. So we're trying to create a situation where we'll have assets that still need active management, but hopefully won't have quite as much risk, and hopefully will allow for different kinds of skills with the next generation. In terms of entitlement, I mean, we've made it clear, and again, Jen Spring and other advisors have taught us this, that you have to have requirements. We've asked people to go to school. With my kids and with the others, we said, go away for five years, go away for seven years. If you want to come back, the door is open, we'd like to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And at least with the two of my kids, they, they both got MBAs, they both moved to New York, one stopped in San Francisco, but I, they've been gone long enough that they said, boy, I think it'd be fun to come home and work for the families. I, we've tried to put in rules so that there aren't entitlements. And really for the others, I think what we're not struggling with, but just trying to deal with, is the relationship between the cousins in a third generation when it's pretty clear at most, three out of the seven will work in the family business, I think. And at the others, I said, they may want some sort of involvement. And so we're trying to think, what are the best ways to preserve their own identities, give them something to do, and, and really how to avoid lawsuits 20 years from now, how to build those shared experiences, yeah. how to build yeah. trust now, yeah. so that when the issues come up, they'll say, we're going to figure this out. So I'm going to switch yours a little bit and talk about family businesses in general. Family businesses usually want to hear from other family businesses. That's a big motivation here in putting this event on today and having you two here. Uh, they want to connect. They want to network. They want to get resources from other family businesses. And so when, how do you solve for that? I mean, there are organizations, Jamie and I work with some of those, and, and Jamie and I both sit on a board of an organization called Family Enterprise USA, whose sole purpose is to promote family businesses. But believe it or not, there's, there's about 50 family business centers around the United States, and, and, and there's more overseas, that aren't as always very functional. Many of them are not very functional. But sometimes that's where families go to get information and resources. So what I would ask both of you is, when you're running your family business, whether it's you or other family members that are, that are working in the business, where do you go to look for those resources? And where do you go to network to find the answers uh, to the challenges that your business and your family's facing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Pat. I think that was my reference to the need is great because I think there's lots of knowledge and lots of good work that's happened in the space. Um, 
Some of it's academic and, and really thought-provoking and good um, because it's taking a longer view and giving you, you know, quantifiable insight. The other part, though, that I think there's an ache for is more experience and more interaction. And so, um, you know, for instance, uh, about 10 years ago in this new role, I started attending Family Business Magazine Transitions mm -hmm. Conference. And it's a great gathering of other family businesses. And I think the most amazing thing is um, that when you get the chance to spend some time together uh, and share, oh, this is a challenge we had, and you feel that you can be in a space where it's a little bit vulnerable, um, but then you find out, oh, we're not alone. Other families have faced the same thing. You know, and, and here we thought it was just us. But and I think that aspect especially is powerful and there's an unlock that happens in that situation that I think powers a lot of family businesses through. We started doing something at our own office with a lot of family businesses in central Ohio. We'll invite them, we tell, call it a tour behind the castle walls and we'll have them bring other family members over and we, we provide the food, we should. Um, but <laughs> right. but um, when they do that, um, you know, they'll share their story, we'll share ours, and we find that we get to know them, and it's a, it's a fun way to network. Although I want to go on Jenny's tour. I think we need to do a yeah. map of all the fun places you go. Yeah. There's a book in there. Yeah. <laughs> the Rendezvous Cafe. <laughs> but I think just spending time, and it, it sounds a little bit cliche, but truly, if you get to that point of trust, and you can share, hey, we're grappling with this. We've got a person who's having a tough time, they're a family member. Do we fire that person? Do we put them in a different job? Making these things up, but... I think they're just different things that different family businesses encounter. Mm -hmm. We've been really fortunate to discover the, the value of being in family networks. And so I, in our family, I was the only one who did YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And it was really life changing for me. There are competitor groups, but there's one called Vantage and there are others. But for those of you who are not involved in one of those groups, I'd, I'd strongly suggest you at least consider it. We also have been able to get involved in some industry groups that are networking groups. And, and one of the best was when we were a home builder, we got involved in a group with other private home builders, almost all of which were family owned. And I think there were either eight or nine of us. And we'd get together twice a year for three days. And it started out how much is lumber and how much are you paying GE versus Whirlpool appliances. Very quickly within a year it got into how are you dealing with family issues and succession yeah. issues and sibling issues. So I, I think my recommendation for all of you, in addition to be huge supporters of the Drucker Global Family Institute, <laughs> is, is get involved in some of these other opportunities. What, what you will learn is there are just multiple ways to solve problems. I, I think that's one of the, I've been able to go the last two years to Harvard through YPO and it's really fun because you get with eight people in a group and there's half of them are from outside the United States and you study cases and you think you ace it after you study this and then someone from Australia or someone from China or someone from Venezuela comes up with a solution completely different. You go, I just never even thought yeah. about that. And so that's why I think Drucker will be so important for people. But all of those experiences to get with people who have common interests but different backgrounds to see there are multiple solutions to problems. And, and to let you know, Jimmy and I talk about this, you're not alone. You may think in the middle of that, God, I've got the worst problem. Everybody else has had some problem mm -hmm. like that, or their best friend has had that problem who can help you out. Well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow up to that, a little bit of a softball question to you, but you know, the way that we talked about the Drucker Global Family Business Institute is it is truly unique in that it's global, first of all. And we don't know any other center out there, family business center, that is global. And second, you know, it has the Drucker principles. I mean, it has the Drucker name. It has Peter Drucker. So we think it's going to be very unique. Um, and while it's here in Claremont, we really think its reach will be very global. So, so my question to you is, based on what you've heard, and granted this is the launch, uh, do you think this is going to be successful, and, and is it something that you would take advantage of, and do you think it's going to be something that's going to be good for the community? And, and I realize, Jamie, you're in Columbus, Ohio, but again, we hope this is going to have a very, very you know, broad reach. Do you think this is, this is something that uh, you, would, you could take advantage of? You know, I, I think uh, absolutely, I mean, would be the short answer, because thought leadership doesn't know any boundaries. And I think um, just the chance to visit today uh, and to spend time past 24 hours, there's an authenticity about here that really is distinctive. And 
you know, for what it's worth, I really feel it. And I, I think that um, the, the quality of the people who are engaged in this, I mean, I think the, the prospects are bright. And I think the great thing is because you're not, this isn't something you're trying to remake. It's something you're trying to shape from the ground up. And I think that's where the tremendous opportunity is because I think a lot of good groups are out there, but I don't know if anyone's moving at the speed of business or change. And I think that uh, Drucker might be uniquely situated to be able to do that. I, I think there's going to be a tremendous need for it. And I'll, I'll answer globally, but also locally, because it's two separate markets, I think. First, I was fortunate 44 years ago when I was a sophomore in college at Claremont Mills College. They said, there's a new professor coming, and you ought to take a class from him. He's supposed to be pretty good. Well, that was Peter Drucker, and I was able to take three classes from him, and he was pretty good. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty good. And, and so he has stayed in my life. I, I haven't read every word of Peter Drucker, but I probably read 20 of his books. And it's rare that a month goes by that I don't refer to one of the books to get some sort of guidance. So I, I think that the Drucker background, the Drucker influence is timeless. And it's, it's just so important. I think in a local sense, there's just a void in what we call the Inland Empire, but it's also this part of Los Angeles County, that there are clusters in Los Angeles County, clusters in Orange County, where there are a lot of big families that share a country club or share USC or share Chapman or the Music Center in Orange County. We don't have that in the Inland Empire here or this part of Los Angeles County. And we also don't have sort of the just the convenings, and we have a disadvantage of geography, because this part of the world, which is four or five million people, it's spread out over enormous area. So I think you're gonna find a very strong local demand here, because nothing else like it exists, because of the quality of the trucker thinking, because of the faculty here, and the students and the alumni here. So I, I think there's gonna be a real need, if executed properly. Then from the global point of view, I think that's what will make Drucker also unique. That when we hear, we're going to hear later from Japan and then Taiwan and then later from different countries, that will really make it special. Because I want to meet somebody from the city of Riverside and how do you think, but I'm probably going to learn more from somebody in Taiwan or somebody in Hong Kong or somebody in Australia. So I, I think all the seeds are in place for this to really thrive as a concept. That's great feedback. And I would agree with all of that, so I'm very excited, very excited about it. Um, so now I'm going to ask, uh, it's probably a difficult question, so you know, take some time if you need to, to think about it. It's really going to revolve around values and culture. Um, family businesses, I think, are different than public companies because typically families have a strong set of values, and typically those values are also within the business. And they promote those values within the business. And that kind of lends toward a culture, I think, that's unique to family businesses. So you have to, you have to blend the corporate culture with the family and the corporate governance with the family governance and the family culture. So how, how, how do you do that in your family? So Jamie, how, how would you handle that in your family? I'll share what we did and a mistake we made um, okay. but that we think we were able to correct. So um, for us, the real starting point for a lot of that was getting to that family um, vision, values, and guiding principles. We were so excited about that because you know, everyone agreed and, and everyone was in alignment. And that was just you know, one of those moments where we didn't know that everyone felt the same way as a family, uh, that we decided that we needed to share it with everybody in all the details. You know, it was about the business in terms of higher expectations in terms of return on capital and things like that. But it wasn't packaged in the language that was for the team member who got hired two months ago. And so uh, we went out and did this uh, big road show. And, and people didn't mind it. I mean, it was fine. It was kind of, but it was, became a stepping stone. And then we realized that that foundation was a family statement and expressive of who we wanted to be. But it was really pretty family centric in terms of related more to ownership. And we really needed to think of our audience and speak in language that maybe express some of the same ideas, but more directly. Um, so we arrived at values. Um, our values are be customer focused, responsive, uh, and hungry, and then also healthy and energetic and humble family. And so we talk about those values all the time. 
family adopts and embraces those values, but in the business, we make sure to talk about it. And then uh, we look for great examples, and we really hold those individuals up in terms of, wow, did you know, no, Mike Toll did this last week, or Toby Real did that, or Susan Converse did this. And I, I think it's helped reinforce it um, in a good way. That's helpful. I think for us, one of the distinctions is that we're family privately owned business, because mm -hmm. I realize there's some family public companies, right. as I can't really comment on those, but being private and family, like your company, yeah. I mean, we really focus the long term. And in real yeah. estate, there's a lot of decisions you can make that are short term smart, but long term stupid. And we, we think not in terms of quarters, but years and decades and even longer than that. So I, I think the long term perspective for us is very important. I think the values is important to say you, you want to give a fair value. You want to treat people the way you want to be treated and the way they want to be treated. We, we're very purposeful in what we do in terms of, we call it intentional development. I mean, when we build houses or communities, we try to say, how could it change someone's health? How can we build a sense of community? How can we bring jobs to the region? And we try to do it in a way that's very different from a lot of our competitors. I'm, I'm not sure we could do that if we were a public company. That because we make investments that even if they didn't pay off, we would do it. We think they pay off, but they probably pay off over decades. But they're also very personally satisfying. I mean, when I sat down, I introduced myself to Jose. The thrill of the night for me, second night, was first <laughs> meeting you and hearing you. But second, I said, where do you live? We live in one of our communities in Fontana. He didn't awesome. know it was ours. I said, how do you like it? He said, I love it. Well, boy, what a thrill to, to have. And we try to get that to all our employees. That, our, our business is a bit like yours. If you drive down the street, you, you see it's one of our communities. You know it's White Castle, not mm -hmm. McDonald's. And you, you feel good. And I think our employees and our family feel good when they see the work that we do. And then the philanthropy, I mean, we really try to give back to the communities. And, and some is self-serving and some is pure philanthropy. If, if we help to make schools better in a city, we, we do it to be a good citizen, but we know over decades, People want to live where they're a good school district. So we, we try to think of things that if we can build better communities, and these are the communities we're going to be in for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, it's a wise investment to do so. It's that idea of giving back strategically, altruistically, but thinking what will the, what will the good things be over decades? And then lastly, with our family, I mean, we try to say, you know, you, you guys, you, you can be in a cruddy business or a good company that makes a difference. Don't. And, and my son went to our company breakfast this year, and one of our longtime employees gave a speech about the company values and what it made. And he said, that swayed him. This was a few months ago. He said, I want to come back and work wow. for that company. It just happened to be us. But it was because <laughs> of the values that a long-term employee talked about. So I thought I have some more questions, but I thought it, it might be helpful if any of you have questions. Um, you know, I'd like to throw it out. Yes. Is there a mic? No. Just to make sure you repeat the question. Okay. I can speak a little louder. Uh, my name is Larry Taylor. I'm a CTU uh, trustee, alum, uh, graduated from Georgia with a PhD in executive management. In fact, Peter was my advisor. <laughs> Uh, but in addition, I'm the president of the National Association of Corporate Directors. We talk a lot about these issues. I guess my question is, my question, my question is, uh, the family council, I'm looking at corporate governance structure, the family council for the family versus the board of directors. Then when you talk about your board structure, can both you talk about whether there is a family council? Yeah, so the question is, and it was actually on my list, so I'm glad you asked it, is do you have a family council or a family board, and, and typically there's a board of directors, and if there's a board of directors of the company, is there also a family council for the family, and how do the two interact? We don't have a formal family council. Um, what we've done through the process of the meetings is, of the family meetings, is each year um, the assignments are kind of uh, determined. And then we form task force to tackle that. So that's something on our list that we do want to tackle. We know it's a best practice. Uh, we think it's going to be really essential as we start to look to transition from fourth to fifth generation. So what we have in place has really worked well. 
um, but it needs to evolve and be ready for what's next. And uh, so that's on our list to do. But we do believe in that separation. Um, right now it's been manageable because uh, the people are in the room and everyone's been engaged. And you are more advanced than we are. In our family journey, which is just five years now, we know it's a best practice, as you said. We, we've been focusing for the last few years just on conflict resolution, getting together, having people understand the business, understand needs. We have not moved to a formal family council yet, and we know we need to. So, Jamie, uh, thank you again for a great uh, presentation. I loved your mission and vision, by the way. That's thank really you. fantastic. And, and you've got me really hungry, so I'm wondering where, <laughs> where and when is the next uh, White Castle somewhere around here? That's the first part of my question. I'm sure some of us are. Well, we're in the here. grocery store, so I mean. Well, and, you are in the grocery yeah, store, so yeah. I can go to Ralph's yeah. tonight and yeah. pick up. Uh, Let them thaw in the fridge and pop them in the yeah. mic for 30 seconds is as close to the drive through as you can get. Right. Yeah, I think I might take you up on that. So my question is, um, well, the whole idea of a family business, because I work with a lot of small to mid-sized companies, and you know, there's a husband and a wife. I guess that qualifies as a family mm -hmm. business. Maybe their son is working. But I guess that qualifies as a family business. And it's always a double-edged sword, right? Having someone that's a relative work in the business. So my question is, how have you been able to reconcile the interests of the family versus the interests of the business? Because I know that sometimes there might be competing priorities and um, I'm sure that's, there's never an easy answer, but what's been your approach or how have you handled mm -hmm. that? Actually, the approach has been uh, recognizing that there's a tension that's gonna always exist between family and business, uh, and that you know, if you go too far over on the spectrum and you're only thinking about it as a family and not paying attention to the business, that can be very detrimental. And if you go too far to the side of just purely being a business, you start to feel less like a family-owned business and more like a publicly traded company with uh, losing the essence of the spirit that's allowed you to be family owned. So for us, I guess I would reference the quote right at the very beginning uh, from Drucker about if you don't take care of the business and recognize that that's the lifeblood, you can get in a lot of bad places. So I think one of the things we really encountered as a family was having that kind of discussion. We held on to a division that was a manufacturing division that was a very, very, very small percent of revenue and lost a few million dollars every year because we were, I think, kind of froze in our tracks because we looked at our vision and said, well, we, we care about people, but what we didn't realize is we can care deeply about people, but find a way to transition and support them. So we sold the division. All 38 people ended up with better jobs because we provided extra support to make sure we got there, and the business is much better off. So for us, I think it's been focused more on how do we get transparent, flag that issue, work through it, and see where we land. Does that help? Does that answer? Okay. Well, we, it's unusual in our company because we have a CEO who's been with us almost 40 years. He's now called the, the fifth brother, even though he's not a brother. His son will probably be the next CEO. So it's, it's an interesting thing because he's perceived as a non-family professional manager but by calling him the fifth brother after 40 years, it, it, it clears that line. I, I mean, we really try to let it be clear. This, this is a business that the family is here to support, but, but it's, we still deal with every family. That, we've got a lot of quirky family members and we're trying to, <laughs> trying to think, how do you deal with that in the most professional way? We, we haven't cracked the code on it yet. Maybe the Drucker Institute will help in that regard. <laughs> I don't know. Every family has quirky family members, yeah. so believe me. Other questions out there? Yes, in the back. So the question was, uh, how often does it come up when a family member isn't carrying their weight and is a double standard for non-family members? Great question. Uh, we're really fortunate. And this is one of the things we're petrified of with the fifth generation because they're not at this point yet. The number of family members in the business has been relatively small given the size of the business. And I can genuinely say that everyone's in the right role. I think there might have been moments where if someone was maybe promoted to a space Artificially, we could have had issues, but the, the, I can genuinely say people really do carry their weight. Um, 
and it's a matter of fit. I think part of what the third generation did really well, well, there wasn't much effort uh, early on on succession planning. When they got into it, they really did a great job. Before that, though, they insisted that if you're going to work in the business, you need to be compensated the same for your job size. So there's uh, all the things we would do for any position, uh, same evaluation cycle. We had some guidelines in place so you know a family member wasn't often reporting to a family member. Uh, don't tell my sister-in-law. She and I work together. Um, <laughs> but I think it's one of those things where you have to be mindful of it. And I, we do know a lot of other family businesses who have encountered that and have had to make tough calls. But ultimately, when they made the right call, the best thing for the business has been to find a better fit. And they've even shared in those instances that sometimes that family member just wasn't as passionate about it, and they're relieved. They felt maybe more it was a burden or you know something that was too much to bear. So mm -hmm. for what it's worth. That's very true. Very true. I think we probably have time for one more question. Uh, what we, you asked one, so <laughs> yes. Uh, what threshold event might cause your family business to become non-family? Would that be family-driven or market-driven? So the, the the question is, what threshold event would cause your family to might cause your family business to become non-family? Family driven or market driven. Yeah. And you ask the question, are you envisioning like going public or sale selling? Or, yeah. somebody, sale. Sell somebody, somebody tomorrow just gave you an offer that was, in your opinion, three times what your business is worth. Mm -hmm. You just take it and just distribute it to the family and walk or what? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I think it's uh, a commitment the family's made to one another to remain family owned for generations to come. So for me to speculate and say, what would that be? I, I couldn't, other than when we do have conversation about what the future holds, our interest and our passion is on remaining family owned and building the best set of circumstances we can for the next generation to be able to make their own decision about, is there a threshold event that, that trips that trigger? And I, I know there's a commitment to, you know, if there were that type of an offer, um, we have good governance in place within the family where there would be consideration and everyone would be consulted. So the biggest thing we've done to prepare for something like that is to know what our focus is, what our priorities are, which is to remain family owned, but also to have a mechanism where we can talk about anything, and we do. So we've called special conference calls when something's gonna happen. Maybe something negative is gonna be in the press about a lawsuit. Um, we were sued by a former employee in Minneapolis and we were decided to settle, and so we called a special call so the family members weren't caught off guard. On the, on the other side of it, I, I think we would encounter it as it comes, and uh, beyond that, it wouldn't be responsible for me to really speculate what exactly it might be, but th that's how we would approach it. I would answer for our family, I think there's two situations. If someone made that incredible offer, we'd be suspicious and say, what do they see that we don't see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think the two things that could trigger it for us would first be, a plane crash where two out of the four brothers got killed. I mean, we try not to fly yeah. together, but if there was some double death or triple death, that might trigger it. The other one I, I don't see for 10, 20, 30 years, but at some point when our generation is gone, that there is a chance that the next generation or the generation after that will say, we don't want to have this business or we don't like those guys. We're trying desperately to not let that happen. But ultimately, we will not be able to rule from the grave. So we're trying to think, how do we create a situation where it's in everybody's best interest to stay together for economic reasons and family reasons? So I, I, I don't think it's likely we would ever not be a family business, but there are at least two things that could cause it. Great Can I just do one, one commercial before we break? Just the, the Claremont Colleges and Claremont Graduate School especially are really special places. And so those of you who are just guests here really give a lot of thought to it. My, our family's been involved in probably a dozen universities, and they all are wonderful. But there's something special about Claremont, the size, the connectivity, the, all the colleges here, and the faculty at CGU is just incredible. So it, it's a shameless commercial, but it's from the heart. This is, <laughs> this is really a special place worth investing in. Yeah, I absolutely concur. Well, I want to thank both of you. Um, for your attention and your great answers to the questions. I'm glad I opened it up to the audience because they all had very, very good <laughs> questions. So thank you and thank you both for coming. Okay, thank we really you. appreciate it.
Thank you. What an interesting panel discussion. Our last speaker for the evening is Koji Agura Agurasan. Uh, Koji is uh, an alum of our program, Executive Management Program 2011. He also comes from a family business. The family business set up a, a company that's similar to UPS in Japan, so it's quite a prominent family business. And Koji's worked tirelessly. He's the director of Japan Draka Ito Relations, and he's worked tirelessly for me to help develop the Japanese market and pay tribute to it in the way we should, given that we're named after Masatoshi Ito. We're going to Japan in, in May. Uh, Agurasan and I saw Yamawaki, Professor Yamawaki, right up the back, uh, taking a group of MBA students to Japan. We have about 19 or 20 going for a week tour of Japan just to experience business Japanese style. We're very excited about that. And toward the end of the tour, I'm going to gate crash the party. Right, there's a, a party going on in Tokyo. And welcome our alumni and prospective students, but also Koji's organized a number of events to allow me to introduce the Institute to Japanese family businesses. We've got an event that Koji's organized with Nikkei BP, which is equivalent of Business Week, and I'll speak for three hours on Japan innovation and family business. We're also uh, being hosted by the Japan Family Business Network chapter, and the thing that's interesting, if you come right back to what we're trying to do as, as a global family Family Business Institute. Every country is very different. I see uh, one of our students from Russia uh, who talked to me right at the beginning of the semester and he said, well, in Russia, you've only had 27 years of entrepreneurship more recently. And so we aren't dealing really with succession planning because we haven't got there yet. Whereas in Japan, the, uh, almost half of the businesses, family owned businesses in, in the world, almost half are 200 years or older. They're in Japan, right? almost half of the 200 year older businesses in Japan, and China's sort of third generation. So when we start to bring together the global angle, I think it leads to some really interesting discussions. So please, Koji, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Again, my name is Koji Ogura, and let me introduce a little bit about myself and my family business. By the way, I came to the States in 2007, and I have lived in Japan for 47 years, and I have lived in the States for 10 years. But you know what? Uh, speaking English for Japanese people is always difficult. So if you don't understand my English, just raise your hand and let me know. I'm happy to switch my language to Japanese, okay? <laughs> so, so far so good, okay? All right, so I am an alumni of the Draco School, as Jenny said. I got an EMBA in uh, 2011. Then I moved to New Jersey and spent four years as a CEO of Yamaha Transport USA. Then I wanted to change my gear, so I left the company and joined the Draco School in 2015. Then. I became the director for Japan and Draka Ido relationship. So, before I joined the Draka school, I was in my family's business for 25 years, which is called Yamato Transport in Japan. So, Yamato Transport was founded by my grandfather in 1919, so it's a 99-year-old company. So I will explain a little bit about this 100, almost 100-year 100 company history in a five minutes. It's not <laughs> easy. So my grandfather started the business with four trucks in Tokyo when there were only 200 trucks all over in Japan. So it's a kind of innovative company, I think. Then Yamato made huge huge profits, especially after World War II, because uh, Yamato was doing business with US military. So this time, Yamato made a huge profit. Then in 1960s and 70s, in Japan, the economy was booming, but unfortunately, my grandfather made a kind of mistake of strategy, so they missed a lot of business opportunity. Then in the 1970s, 
there was an oil crisis. So Yamato was struggling in the 1970s. And in, I think in the mid-1970s, uh, Yamato was ranked as most likely to bankrupt company in Japan, seriously. So at that time, my father took over the company and he made a drastic decision to withdraw all commercial cargo business and he started a small package delivery business called Takyubi. So he started this new service in 1976 so Yamato started new businesses called Takibin, small package delivery service, mainly for individual consumers. At that time, only government-owned companies, one is Japan Post and one is Japan National Railways, they did small package delivery. But no private company did that because this business was not profitable at all. So no uh, private company did that. So Yamato was the first and only private company getting into this uh, small package market. At that time, my father's or Yamato's strategy was kind of simple. So focusing on a high quality service. And this high quality service will generate new demand and expand the market. Because at that time, Japan Post and Japan National Railways service was horrible. Everybody knows these services were horrible, and my father knew that service was horrible. So they just focused on the quality of the service. But actually, everyone laughed at Yamato and said, they are crazy, you know, starting small package business. Oh, Yamato, crazy. And in fact, the first day of the new business, I think Yamato carried only 11 packages. At that time, I think company already have two or 3,000 employees, so only 11 packages. And I know at least two or three packages were sent by my father. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so actually maybe seven or eight pure you know, package. So they left again and said, now Yamato will bankrupt. But did Yamato bankrupt? Fortunately not. So now they carry 1.7 billion packages annually. And I think average package per day is four or five million a day. And they have uh, 200,000 employees now. So luckily they didn't bankrupt and they grow but maybe too too large so my opinion through my 25 year experience in this company i believe the most important things that business successors like me always have to keep in mind are one is how to maintain the founder's philosophy and number two is how to change or adjust their strategy from founders one. I think that's the two most important things. So they have to deliver founders philosophy to the market through their product or service. And this will be the brand image, I think. And they also have to deliver this uh, founders philosophy to the employees internally. And this will determine the quality of the service or quality of the business. So that's really uh, important. And ag again, strategy is also very important for the family business to survive. So founder may sometimes, I don't say always, but founder may sometimes stick to the past success and may believe it will work forever. Actually, I don't know, but my grandfather was that. And even when market has changed, or society has changed, or world has changed, he or she might stick to the past uh, success. So sometimes somebody may have to say, we need to change. So if we can do that, maybe family members, hey dad, we have to change. 
So family members such as young successors have very important role, especially in a small or mid-sized businesses. So I believe this Global Family Business Institute is the best place, especially for a young generation to enhance their knowledge and skills. In Japan, there are more than four million businesses and I believe almost 95 to 97% of these businesses are family owned. So it's quite, you know, important in the Japanese uh, economy. So I'm so happy and proud of being a part of this great opportunity and looking forward to welcoming family business members from the world, especially from Japan, of course. So I want to say congratulations, omedetou gozaimasu, to Jenny, and thank you, arigatou gozaimasu. Well, we're on the downhill run. <laughs> What a great launch we've had. I want to start by uh, giving some thank yous and then talk a little bit about what's ahead for the next year. I have to start my thank yous with Kathleen Farris. Can you please stand up, Kathleen? Kathleen's been part of the CGU community for quite a number of years, and when I looked at all of the things we were trying to achieve this semester, I thought there's no way that I can possibly do that given everything else we have to do. And so I, I reached out to Kathleen and I said, Kathleen, do you have just a little bit of time you can come and help us? Best thing I ever did. And tonight, and the success of tonight, is testimony to Kathleen's incredible hard work and dedication. Very, I don't think you leave any stone unturned, and you've worked tirelessly to make this evening a tremendous success, so thank you. I also want to give a shout out, I've already acknowledged uh, Jean and Vijay Sathe, and I see Hovig, uh, hands up Hovig, uh, one of our professors, I see Kat at the back, uh, Hideki Yamawaki, Chris Langdon, uh, one of our professors as well, have I missed anyone, because I'll get in big trouble if I've overlooked anyone, no, I haven't forgotten anyone, so thank you very much for giving up your evening to come to the launch, and for all the work we've done together to get us to this point. On the staff side, I can see Connie, I can see Alia, and I can see Brian. Can I still see Brian? He might have disappeared to pick up children. Oh, where, where, is he outside? Okay. So we've got a number of staff who are going to join us at the reception and have also worked tirelessly. Some of them greeted you as you came in. And we have a tremendous staff and an incredible faculty, and, and we're, in, we're, we're just enjoying a lot of the initiatives that we're all working on together to try and make the Draka School even stronger than it is. I see a number of students. So hands up if you're a current student, please. Great to see you here. It's good to welcome you to our launch. Thank you very much. We, we have a number of alum too, so please hands up. I, I can see many of you. Make sure I don't miss any of you. Great to see you back, and thank you for giving us your evening to help us celebrate the launch. Thank you. So I want to move on, and, and we have a number of things that we've got planned for 2018-2019. Uh, we want to make sure we can deliver on our promise. If you know me well, you know that I don't like what I call gonna talk. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I want to make sure we have a, a line up of, of activities and we deliver in the most excellent way we possibly can. So we have launched a, a family business concentration, and Vijay Sathe is leading us with that first course, a survey course in family business. To the alum in the room, don't forget we have the free four unit course that you can come back and take at any time so make sure that if you're interested in taking VJ's course that you come back and take that or any other and is Andrew here? I think Andrew might have gone if you, if you need information on some of the courses then reach out to one of us and we can help you. So we have the concentration with a course and also a big part of our curriculum is practicum and we have the opportunity for students to work on problems of importance to them. They may well be family business problems, things that you're facing or if you follow Andrew Chen's example, corporate venturing or other sorts of startups within the family business structure. So we welcome, we welcome those. We're also launching, as you can tell, part of our, our footprint, if you will, is to be global. We are launching global family business chapters around the world. So you can launch our Russian one for us, please do. Uh, Gary Chan, who's just uh, 
jumped out as helping us with the China initiative. Koji Agura will help us with Japan. Of course, Andrew Chen with, uh, with Taiwan. Virginia, I think you might just help us with Hong Kong. <laughs> you can now. <laughs> I see you in the audience. Athena's helping us with our local chapter as well. So we're going to get moving and form these local chapters around the world. The idea is for Draka alumni and also people who just simply want to be connected with the Draka brand to come together to share common experiences about global family business, but also connect with other family business chapters around the world. And we think that's a hugely beneficial angle, aspect of what we can offer. We also want to start a, an affinity group, a club, call it what you will, on the college campus. I wish I'd have thanked Ra um, Randall for his great advertisement for the strength of the colleges. We didn't pay him to say that, by the way. It came from the heart. But many students are among the seven colleges come from family businesses. So we want to be a centre of gravity for those students. In addition to that, we've got uh, a promise to deliver on three workshops and one signature event uh, for family businesses. We're planning loosely, so mark your calendars, but we just need to get a bit, we need to get over today. I think we just need to celebrate today and then look to the future. But we're thinking of August, maybe August the 8th, to have a symposium for global family businesses to come here to talk about a number of topics to share among themselves. Uh, succession planning is always the front and centre of that, those discussions, but we'll have a number of things that feed into that, including innovation, corporate venturing, and how do we grow family businesses. So we'll come up with something more concrete. We're also looking tentatively at June the 27th, Wednesday, but I've got to check with my advisory council too, to have more of a local launch uh, and to make sure that we can bring together local family businesses to start the local activities that we want to share. I think that's covered everything. So what, what's my call to action? How can you get involved? Of course, as we get moving and we start forming the local chapters, please join one of the local chapters. Uh, link with other people from around the world as we get moving through 1819. Make sure you pay attention to your email, your inbox, to look at the programming and the events that are coming up. If you want to take courses, of course, become part of our MBA, our Executive MBA program. We have a great program. We're really proud of the program we've put together and the, the flavor that is very Drucker-like, very applied and based around Drucker principles and practice-based learning. Um, if you want to donate your time, we, we're always willing to take your time. If you want to donate to the Family Business Institute, donate money. We're happy to, to accept it to allow us to do the work we're trying to do. We want the, work, the Institute to be truly world-class to achieve what we believe we can do with the Draca brand and the global footprint we have behind. I want to close with a vision. I, I want us, we're going to move on and celebrate the success of the day. I know for me and my staff and faculty, we, we, we're looking forward to the, the little glass of wine we might just be having quite soon. Um, but we've finally got to the finish line of launching the Global Family Business Institute. But an institute, really, what we're trying to do, as you know, is serve the needs of family businesses all around the world. So partner with us, allow us to achieve our vision, which is to foster sustainable family businesses that positively impact communities. So thank you very much. You'll see the crowd move to Hagel Bargas. That's where we're heading. Chef Bernadette's looking after us. So I look forward to celebrating our success and, and meeting you and talking to you more about what we're doing. So thank you very much. We appreciate it.